Hey film fans, every once in a while a film comes along that's beautifully made, beautifully rendered, the performances are excellent, the cinematography is outstanding, the script, the direction, everything just comes together to make this wonderful film, but one that's also a groundbreaking film. And in this sense I mean groundbreaking in that it ushers in a change in the way that we conceive of how films can be made. They could be Hollywood films, American films, or, or globally. Oftentimes when we think about films like this, we think about the style or the form. Citizen Kane, Star Wars, The Matrix. But other times it's the case that the, the groundbreaking nature of the film is more topical. It's about the subject matter, the narrative. Such is the case with the 1985 film Desert Hearts. The first, or let's say one of the first, openly lesbian films that was widely distributed in the United States and beyond. But not only that, not only is Desert Hearts openly lesbian, but the lesbian love story is central to it, constructs the film's point of view, so it's not a film necessarily about how everybody outside of the romance from the straight community sees it, although there are elements of that. It's about how the women involved see it, how they experience this burgeoning relationship. And it's a hopeful film. It's a positive film. It doesn't dwell on a history of doomed lesbian love. And in that sense, Desert Hearts created the possibility for a new kind of American film. And while the uptake was slow, much of screen media today in America and the depictions of positive, loving, natural, normal lesbian romances descend directly from this 1985 film, which is the subject of this episode of What Makes This Film Great. Desert Hearts is a 1985 film. It was directed by Donna Deitch from a screenplay by Natalie Cooper based on a novel, The Desert of the Heart, by the Canadian novelist Jane Rule, who wrote novels oftentimes with, with lesbian themes. It stars Helen Shaver and Patricia Charbonneau, and it features cinematography by Robert Ellswit and production design by Janine Oppowall. And all of these people involved, most of whom were early in their career, went on to do other great things. Robert Ellswit, some of you might know, is the go-to cinematographer for Paul Thomas Anderson and has shot most of his films. Janine Oppowall has been nominated for several Academy Awards for production design. Uh, Helen Shaver has acted in numerous Hollywood films, but also become a really important television director and she's directed episodes of Orphan Black. Recently she's directed episodes of Westworld, Snowpiercer, and Lovecraft Country. So it was a great amount of talent that went into the creation of this film, most of whom were early in their career, if not starting out. Desert Hearts is the story of Vivian. Vivian's in her mid-30s and she's an English professor at Columbia University married to a man who's also a professor. And she has come to Reno, Nevada, where the film is set, to get a divorce. There, while she's living there, she meets Kay. And Kay is a generation younger. She's in her early 20s. And she works at, as a change girl at one of the local casinos. And the film is about their burgeoning friendship and then eventually romance and love affair amidst the late 1950s Reno, Nevada divorce tourism culture. Divorce tourism. <laughs> For those of you who are younger who might not know, in the 50s and really up until the late 60s, it was very difficult to get a divorce in the United States, um, particularly if it was initiated by the woman. Um, she had to prove all kinds of sort of mental or physical or emotional distress. It had to be accounted for. And oftentimes, regardless of uh, the financial situation of the partnership, the man walked away with all the money and assets. But if a woman could afford it, she could go to Nevada, off in Reno, establish residency for six weeks, and then get what was basically a kind of no-fault divorce. 
a rubber stamp, you're divorced. And it was up to her and the husband to sort of divide up the assets as they saw fit. And so a lot of women did this and Reno became a kind of divorce uh, destination. And the town was designed around this. So there were hotels <laughs> that were built right next to the courthouse. And there was a lot of entertainment put on. There were bars, but also casinos because Nevada had the gambling history. Um, opportunities to go out into nature, into the desert, to ride horses, to visit dude ranches, and so on, to keep these women active and entertained during the six weeks when they had to establish this residency in order to get the divorce. This is the milieu of the film. It's also worth noting that in the 30s and 40s, Reno had developed a reputation as something of a LGBT friendly town. It wasn't necessarily flamboyantly open, but it was a town that recognized, um, you know, an early version, not to, not to sort of modernize it too much, but an early version of gay rights. And there were drag bars and there were gay bars in Reno. With the coming of the 50s and McCarthyism and the sort of re-entrenchment of a kind of American conservatism, that started to diminish. And the film does a good job of depicting some characters who have a problem with lesbianism. But it also does a fine job of depicting a lot of other characters who have no problem at all, who embrace this, who are happily friendly with Kay, who are affectionate with Kay, despite, you know, her um, issue as it's framed by some of the straighter, more conservative people in the film. Vivian, who's played by the Canadian actor Helen Shaver, is early in the film almost a stereotype of the uptight East Coast professor. She's very prim in her dress, in her hair. Helen Shaver has this beautiful, almost kind of patrician voice that almost commands respect with everything that she says, but she has it in her mind that she's out here for one thing, one thing only, and she doesn't want any distractions. In fact, she's chosen to stay at the Dude Ranch rather than at one of the hotels in town because she believes it'll give her a modicum of privacy. And she establishes her boundaries and her primness at the same time in this early scene. I suppose we'd all put in for a new past if we could. Well, good morning. Good morning. I came down to stretch my legs. It's about time. What have you been doing in that room for the last five days? Whatever it is, it's too deep for us to understand. Come on, sit down. Join the girl talk. We were discussing sex versus marriage. Well, I'm not an expert in either category, so I'll excuse myself. I hear you culture types go at it like Banshee. Lucille! Is that true? Well, actually, Banshees were folklore women whose wailing foretold death. Perhaps you meant to say monkeys. Hey. Well, I, I gotta get started on my pie. Lucille, would you drop Kay's mail by the cottage for me? I'll take it. I'm going for a walk anyway. You can just slip it under the door. One of my favorite early scenes is when Vivian is spending a little bit of time with Francis. Francis runs the dude ranch and they have this moment in one of the first evenings where everyone else has gone to bed and they meet and they drink a little whiskey. And I just, there's something I love about this and I'll show it to you first and then comment on it. I'm, uh, I don't know what I am. I'm not anything really. Just a pair of hands and a familiar face. <laughs> Thank you. Handsome as the day is long, and married. I lived with him for 10 years. Well, maybe I didn't get a bridal bouquet to add to my collection over there, but I had what I wanted. I had a love of my own. That's a beautiful song. You had more than most people dare hope for. Oh, 
pay attention. <laughs> I just bat fun. I'm a silly woman. I don't think you're a silly woman, Francis. <laughs> I love the way they each drink their whiskey and there's none of this like mm, uh, uh, uh. It's it's so refreshing because even in in um, cowboy films a lot of the times you see the male wince and certainly when we see women drink whiskey in films there's this sense that uh you know, oh, it's so strong for their so their prim self. And Vivian seems like she would be that kind of character. And the fact that they just sip their whiskey, it's fantastic. I love it. And it tells us so much about both of them. Francis is a very important character. And you'll probably recognize there, the astute viewers amongst you, that she's played by Audra Lindley, Mrs. Roper from Three's Company. That's right. And it's a fantastic performance. And Francis, as I said, runs the dude ranch. She's also Kay's stepmother. Francis and Kay's father married sometime before the film, many years before, and Kay's father has since passed away. And Francis feels responsible for her. She promised Kay's father that she would take care of her. She also has one son and he's kind of the ranch hand and he's this sort of sexy James Dean type and we're led to believe that he's oftentimes a, a bit of a boy toy for some of the women who are coming there to get divorced. Uh, and that, that plays a minor role in the film because he spends quite a bit of time flirting with Vivian and, and she flirts back. I know you'd like me to hang around and uh give you a history of the ranch. How did you guess, Walter? Kay, on the other hand, while, while her stepbrother kind of sits in the background and pops up when necessary. Kay is a, is a whirlwind character. She's, she's moving, she's always like full of life, often on the move. Oh, brother. guesses who that was. Do you mind if I smoke? Sure don't. Always full of a sort of um, joy in life. She smiles. She has the appearance, I think, Patricia Charbonneau of a young Sean Young in her, uh, her smile, even in her voice a little bit. And, but she has a lot more energy where Sean Young often played the sort of cool, laid back, often femme fatale. Charbonneau here as Kay is, is boisterous and fun and the people around her love her and they, they care a lot about her. And I'll come back to that in a minute because one of my favorite scenes in the whole film sort of revolves around her, one of her important friendships. Um, an uncomfortable storyline that runs throughout the film is the relationship between Kay and her boss, Daryl, played by Dean Butler. And Daryl is the owner of the casino. And early in the film, he seems like a pretty nice guy. He's funny. He jokes around with all the, the change girls. But he and Kay seem to have had a previous relationship. The film's a little bit ambiguous about how um, long or how involved it was. But Daryl's clearly not over it. And he pursues Kay throughout the film. He knows that she's a lesbian. He knows that she loves women. And... He, he frames his sort of uh, wooing of her in this way that is quite uncomfortable where he'll say things like, I know what you're like, I know who you are, and I'm willing to overlook it. Like, you're willing to overlook it, dude? 
And he gets increasingly aggressive. But the film is not the kind of film that's gonna follow that aggression down a negative path. If, if you're used to sort of um, darker, sort of twisted lesbian films, which there are a lot of, there's a sense while you're watching it that Daryl's gonna pull some violence. Um, but the film never goes down that route. I think, again, to its credit as a film that's interested in exploring something else, but it definitely paints Daryl as a problematic and creepy character who Kay is trying to get away from. But the, one of the great things about Kay's character, about Charbonneau's performance of Kay, is that she's never written or performed as in over her head. She handles Daryl always. And there's never, while he's portrayed as increasingly creepy, he never seems dangerous because Kay always knows how to extricate herself from the situation. Uh-oh, here comes Snake Eyes. Not your hard one to track down. I thought your nights were spent sniffing after Joyce. You got it backwards for a change. This here's our friend, Vivian. Hmm. Whose friend? My friend. I'm Daryl. How do you do? You're probably doing better. So we're uh, assuming that new outfit you just bought, huh? No. I barely had the nerve to buy it, but Katie persuaded me to throw caution to the wind. <laughs> That's what she's best at. I think I'm going to try my luck. Whatever you set out to do, you accomplished quite the opposite. That, I think, is a really important part of the story because it creates the confidence in Kay as a viewer to believe that she would exist in this world as she exists in this world. Even as, while the film develops and her relationship with Vivian becomes more public, some of the people in her life reject her because of it. One of my favorite scenes in the entire film comes early in the film before Kay and Vivian have started to get involved. And we're learning a little bit about Kay's background. And she's close friends with a woman named Silver, an older woman who's also a change girl at the casino. And Silver's in a relationship with a guy named Joe. And Joe's an old sort of Italian guy who seems to have, um, he knows his way around a little bit. And these two older folks have found this love that's really wonderful. And in the novel, which I haven't read, um, it's made clear that Silver and Kay, whose name is different in the novel, uh, had a relationship in the past, a physical romantic relationship in the past. In the film, this is more implied. Early on, they, they share a kiss, a kiss on the lips. It could be read as friendly, but it's also quite intimate. But later comes this scene, and I'm not going to introduce it. I'm just going to show it to you. Okay, now start talking. If you're gonna laugh, this must be serious. I think I found somebody who counts. From the beginning, and don't step over the good parts. Well, she's an English professor, and she's 10 years older than I am. <laughs> well, rock and roll! That sounds a lot funnier than it is. She out of the ranch? Well, you promised not to mess around. Vivian Bell. I just say her name when I want to smile. You sleeping with her? No. And I probably won't. Don't she want to? Well, it's not about that, so. Just you remember she's gonna. Pick up her decree and be gone. Well, maybe by then I'll figure out something in this screwed up little life of mine. I love your life, babe. I wouldn't want to be here without it. Oh, you look like two desserts. <laughs> oh, beg your pardon. You know. Sometimes I honest to God wish I knew what it felt like to be a gorgeous woman. You want the ring back, honey? No. 
Maybe I'll be reincarnated. <laughs> I got put the stakes on. Joe? Mm. I'm afraid if it stays this good, I'm gonna find a way to screw it up. Hey, don't I always get you through the good times, huh, babe? There is so much that I love about this scene. I love the way it's shot. I love the way it's performed. And I love when Joe walks in and everything is normal. This is a scene that I think in a lot of ways normalizes an understanding of male, female, 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 different, a different spectrum of affection, love, and care that's much more prevalent today than it would have been in the 1980s when this film came out. Because the film, as I said, doesn't present Kay and Silver as former lovers, although it does imply that. But this scene of two women, two grown women, in this beautiful, luxurious bath, spending time together, sharing their stories, and then one of the women's lovers, soon to be fiance, and by the end of the film, husband, comes in and is just so casual with it and is so fun with it, and the women are so comfortable with it. There's nothing, like if you compare Joe's performance with Daryl's, there's nothing in Joe that is predatory or leery. He's just a guy who understands what's going on and is completely comfortable with it. And to me, in a lot of ways, this scene is almost more groundbreaking than the beautiful kiss scene, which is quite famous, and love scene, which is quite famous, which come later. And it's just one of the many beautifully shot and beautifully rendered parts of this film. And this is one thing to keep in mind. This film would always be important based on its narrative and the performances. But one of the things that makes it so fantastic is that it's a beautifully made film as well. Let's look at this scene of Vivian on the ranch watching some horses. Crazy. I'm crazy for feeling so lonely. I'm crazy, crazy for feeling so good. Everything about that really works for me, but what I most particularly love and what I think is, is, is fabulously done is the way that Vivian is framed behind the planks of the gate. So this is often used in film and it's, it's kind of a cliche almost to imply imprisonment. And here she's watching these horses and, and she's watching freedom. And she has this moment with her wedding ring where she's having a realization of the possibility or the potential of freedom. And so much takes place via performance and cinematography the, 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 the production design of that gate that, that tells us so much about where Vivian's at. She is on a threshold. She doesn't quite know what the threshold is yet, but she's there. And the, and the, the, the form of the film tells us that. And then there's that wonderful dissolve cut. Now, one thing that I, I would be a little critical about in the film is that its edit choices are sometimes a little bit confusing, I think. On occasion, it uses wipes which Star Wars had done a few years earlier to, to sort of great effect, but they don't seem to have a purpose and they seem to be sometimes random. There's three or four wipes. There are a lot of fades to black, but on occasion there are these beautiful dissolves. There are about three or four just wonderful dissolves that are so fantastically matched that we actually get more story information like we do in that scene there. The cinematography is, in a lot of ways, stately. There are a lot of tableau shots or barely moving cameras. But again, it's used in fantastic ways to further the story. Here's two short examples. Come 
Morning. Morning. So the way that she's revealed there, I think, is, is fantastically done. And here, much later, this is at Silver's engagement party during a dance. And this very subtle but beautiful sort of push through the crowd. The stars in the sky know the reason why I cry. No. What are you dreaming about, old lady? Glenn and me used to go dancing here. I swear if I was to turn around right now, it's like he'd be standing right behind me. Why him and nobody else? Because he reached in and put a string of lights around my heart. Again, the way these very simple camera movements let story unfold and bring us information when it's necessary. And, you know, wherever the camera frame is in both of these examples is telling us something important. And as it shifts its attention, it's continuing to tell us something important while it refocuses the attention of the camera and, and therefore the attention of the viewer. And watching these two scenes and the way the camera moves here, I think you can begin to see why someone like Paul Thomas Anderson would look at Ellsworth's work and be like, this is somebody that I want to work with because this is the kind of camera deployment that I'm going to favor in my storytelling. As the film develops, Vivian and Kay become closer and one of the things that it does so well is it portrays Kay's clear awareness that the two are falling in love while at the same time honoring Vivian's sort of cluelessness at first or lack of awareness while at the same time showing the attraction. Donna Deitch cast Charbonneau as Kay first and then she didn't know who was going to play Vivian and she had three or four different performers in mind and she called them all out and Charbonneau screen tested with all of them. And when Shaver and Charbonneau screen tested, Deitch has talked about it was electric right from the beginning. And you get that sense throughout the film. And so that, that chemistry of their performance is drawing these two characters together. And one of the lovely things about the film is the way it exhibits the difference in their awareness of what's going on. And it comes to fruition finally in one of the most famous scenes from the film, the kiss scene. And it starts off, I'm going to show it to you in just a second, but it starts off with a lot of the tropes of melodrama. And it has a lot of the sort of tropes of romance and it also has a lot of the tropes of, of the Western and there's a film scholar, Andrew Patrick Nelson, who's done some interesting stuff talking about Desert Hearts as a Western and I'll post a link to his podcast on that below. But the way it uses its melodrama, its Western nature, look at their clothes and the, the, the history of romance on film to build this moment is just, it's wonderful. Have a look. So how long were you with Daryl? Not long. What happened? I allowed myself to get attracted to his attraction for me. For him, that spelled love. And for you? <laughs> well, let's put it this way. I didn't exactly get the brass ring. How do you get it? With a woman. Are you trying to shock me? No. I was only telling you the truth. Have I misled you in any way? Not for a minute. Because you know I care a lot about you, Kay, but I...
right? Everything about that from the hand holdings to the thunder to the rain to that final kiss and the resistance and the coming together. There's so much tension and it's fraught with so much sort of yearning. It's, it's just beautifully shot and beautifully performed. It's, it's one of the great first kisses in cinema history. Deitch said, and she says repeatedly in interviews, that she wanted to make a lesbian romance film. And the thing that was important to her was that it didn't end with a suicide or death or a bisexual love triangle. And she was looking around for projects and she came across Rule's novel. And while they made changes to it, that central story is what attracted Deitch. She said she read it and then she read it seven more times right after that. And, and that's the film that we get. A film that, while it might be a stretch to say that it's a happy ending because there's some ambiguity in the, in the ending, it's most definitely a hopeful ending. It's an ending that, it's a beautiful ending. I don't want to spoil it for you, but there's an element to it of we don't know where this is going to go, but it feels like it's going to go in the right direction. And that, it, it's a love film. And when you come out of it, you feel uplifted like you do after the best romance films that you've seen. And Deitch succeeded. Like, I wonder if beyond her expectations, or maybe she had the confidence throughout to know that this was magic, this film that she was making. And it is magic, and there's so much more that I could say about it. Audra Lindley's performance is so good and heartbreaking. Her growing realization that Kay is a lesbian and that she has rejected Daryl. But it's not just that. It's that she's losing Kay, and by losing Kay, she's kind of losing um, the last tangible connection she has to her, her dead husband. And that performance is wonderful, even as Francis becomes less wonderful as a character. And uh, the, the, the desert scape, the horse work, the gambling, the casino work. It's a wonderfully made and beautiful movie. And it's, I hate to say it, but it's true. It's an important movie. And it's not the kind of important movie where you watch it and go, eh. It's the kind of important movie where you watch it and go, yeah. Yes. So make sure you check this out. Desert Hearts, 1985, fantastic film. It's recently been the subject of a lot of sort of retrospectives and it, it came out on Criterion, so it should be pretty easy to find. There are a lot of interviews with Deitch, with Shaver, with Charbonneau and others on YouTube, on the Criterion disc and so on. Deitch has said she's working on a sequel and I'm not exactly sure how that's going to work, but she said it's set about 10 years later in the late 60s during the second wave of the women's movement. So that'll be interesting to see if that comes to fruition. That's supposedly in pre-production right now, but definitely search this film out. It's, it, it's a film that just takes you in, shows you something that maybe the younger amongst you are like, oh, this is old hat, but still you haven't seen it done like it's done here. Thanks for watching everybody. I'm Aaron Hunter. And if you've been watching my channel for a while, hit the like, I'd love if you'd hit subscribe and I'd love if you'd share this video. Also, what do you think of Desert Hearts? Drop a comment below and let me know what you think. Um, is it all that or am I totally overselling it? I'm not. <laughs> Anyhow, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. My name is Aaron Hunter. Until next time, keep watching movies.